This is RPG Maker 2. It is a 3D RPG Maker that released for the PlayStation 2. So, a couple of months ago, I was showing off a game I was creating for RPG Maker 1 on the first PlayStation called Cassandra and the Shadow. And it's been a while since I've posted an update to that game. In fact, I haven't posted an update at all. Uh, part of it was because I was busy recording New Game Plus for Oasis, but also I was working at moving the game to RPG Maker 2. Because I had a thought. What if... What if... I made it into a 3D platformer? Still an RPG, but with also a 3D platformer platforming. Now, RPG Maker 2 is not really made for making platformers at all. There are a couple of commands that can change your height. There's the hover option, which heightens your character, but your physics are still on the ground. Regardless of how high your character may seem, as far as the game is concerned, your character is still on the ground and cannot walk off of ledges. There is also a height command, which does physically raise your character, but they immediately snap down back to the ground the moment they try to move. However, thanks to some scripting trickery invented by someone who goes by the name of Neo Nash 7777, at least I'm assuming that's the first person who figured this out, it is actually possible to create a platforming engine using a vehicle, specifically an airship. This exclamation mark box that I am in right now is an airship. And if I press a button, I am able to jump. And if I press a direction, I'm able to move while still in the air. Now, this platforming engine that I've been working on isn't perfect. Like I said, RPG Maker 2, not made for platformers. So while it seems like my vertical momentum is smooth, the moment I try walking, it is not. Because while you're trying to move horizontally, you can't actually move vertically. It's not until you travel to the next space that the game catches up to where its vertical placement should be. So, it's definitely a little janky. Not to mention, as you probably noticed, the shadow is uh, suddenly spawning on occasion. And this is because I've currently got the shadow set to follow Cassandra. Uh, the airship automatically tries to keep your party together rather than have them follow you. So when my momentum is fast enough, I actually outpace the shadow and he briefly spawns while he's trying to catch up back to Cassandra. And while the party is together, the extra party members don't appear. They only appear when they're separate from the leader. What I'll probably do is just not have the shadow follow Cassandra at all. And then we won't have that little bit of glitchiness with the shadow suddenly appearing. Otherwise, yeah, this actually works pretty good. We can actually hop onto ledges. We can hop across ledges if my timing was good. The game recognizes when I drop off a ledge, and I can even hop up beneath a ledge onto the higher platform. Now, how the game is detecting when the player is on the ground, it is done with these boxes right here. The airship script is basically checking the location of these boxes. There's this pair of boxes, there's a pair of boxes right here, and on the lowest floor there's a box here, and a box here. So what is going on is the game is checking if the player is at or to the right of this box while also being up or to the left of this box. Basically, creating a space where if the player is within these boundaries, the player stops falling. And in fact, the player is in a constant state of falling. However, the script is also checking 
the height of this box here. So while the player is falling, it checks if it's fallen below this box, and if that's the case, it snaps the player back up to floor level. And it happens in less than a frame, so you don't actually see the player dip below the floor. Meanwhile, I'll go ahead and just jump up to this box. Now, I am to the right of this box, and to the down of this box, and to the left of this box, and to the up of this box. Therefore, the player knows, or the game knows, the engine knows, that we are above this platform, and in fact are standing on it. Then if I drop down here, yes, I am to the right and to the down and to the left and to the up, but I am below this box, so the script ignores these two boxes and instead checks the location of the next pair of box boxes, which is this box and this box. And the engine uses a priority system. First it's checking this pair of boxes, then it's checking this pair of boxes, and if it's not detecting me within and above these boxes, then it is moving on to the last pair of boxes. So despite this shank, I'm definitely kind of proud of this system I've got here. It, it actually works surprisingly well. I'm kind of proud of it. Oh, by the way, there is a system in place to allow the player to jump after they've walked off a ledge. Kind of like in the Donkey Kong Country games. How appropriate that we're playing as a monkey. Uh, this was not entirely intentional, though. Rather, it was all too easy to... Start walking off the ledge before hitting the jump button. The jump timing was really tight. You had to make sure to clearly press the jump button before you reach the edge. Otherwise, you start falling and the jump doesn't register. So, in order to make up for that, I just made it so that the jump is allowed even after falling off the ledge. And it's going to definitely allow for some platforming opportunities. I'm also going to need to make sure to alter the gravity a bit, increase the strength of gravity the longer you fall so that you can't glide across. This is definitely a work in progress. I'm also hoping to eventually make some vines and ladders that you can climb, perhaps even leap into, although that's going to require some testing in order to figure out how well that will work. There is another quirk with this system. The jump engine is waiting for the player's input and RPG Maker 2 waits for any input and this includes pressing a directional button so if you happen to press a directional button and the jump button at the exact same time it doesn't register the jump button because it noticed you press the directional button so got to be wary of that. You got to kind of learn to work with how the f jump engine in RPG Maker 2 is able to work. But there's a couple other things I want to point out. There's a wall here, but there's not a wall anywhere else. And because I'm riding an airship, technically, uh, by the way, all of these boxes would be invisible during actual gameplay. I just have them transparent so I can you know, keep track of them. It's also entirely possible to the player for the player to spawn immediately in an airship. I don't have to wait for the player to walk into it. But because I am in an airship, that means if I were to go anywhere that there are no markers, I just fly off into the void. So I'm definitely going to have to make sure to wall in anywhere I don't want the player to wind up going. And of course, the moment I get back in bounds, that's when gravity takes hold because now I'm within these two markers. And using the marker system was a pretty smart move on my account. Granted, I've kind of borrowed the idea from Super Mario 64. Thankfully, we won't have to worry about any invisible walls blocking your jumps. But this is a system that once in place, 
is easy to modify. Like, let me let me point out these two boxes. I've got these two boxes sitting here. I'm going to go ahead and move them. That would be an event placement, test map. Uh, ignore these other maps. There's a bunch of preset maps. And this is also going to be the opening scene of the game right here. So I'm just going to go ahead and remove that box after kind of copying this information. I'm going to select this box so it's currently selected. Delete that version. Place it here. And press select to exit. RG Maker 2, by the way, very, very complicated. Like, in order to turn the camera, I'm holding, having to hold R1 and press a direction. And this is only in the editor. If I were in gameplay, all I would have to do is press the shoulder button, not any direction. RG Maker 2 has some convoluted button controls when it comes to anything involving map editing. And in fact, the way I was doing this, I was pressing X to select this object, holding square and pressing down to go into delete mode, pressing X a couple of times to delete it, holding square to pressing up to go back into placement mode, and pressing X a couple of times to place it again. Complicated! I don't know why they couldn't just have had a menu to do this stuff. Although, for what it's worth, if you press the start button, you can get a character who helps tell you how to work the game. And as this character is saying right here, there is a beginner and hard mode. Uh, there's various difficulties of making a game in RPG Maker 2. Beginner mode restricts your options to the bare bones. You can't really make much with it. And hard mode unlocks all of the options. I can tell you right now, you are not making a game in beginner mode. And probably not in the medium difficulty either. Oh! RPG Maker 2 also has a screensaver. That's kind of fun. I miss screensavers like this. You know, if I wanted to, I could just sit back and relax and just listen to the peaceful music while watching these triangles bounce around. But I'm not. But yeah, she tells you all the button combinations. And in fact, there is a help message for every single menu in the game. RPG Maker 2, really powerful, but it's got a learning curve, I tell you what. Pressing select to exit and get back into test play and as i hop back in here and just showing right now yes because i moved the placement of these boxes that means the engine automatically knows to check these boxes and therefore because i'm within them i am technically standing on a platform as far as I, the game is concerned and because there's no box here, I fall through the platform because the physics are here, but not here. So any new map I create, all I have to do is place each pair of these boxes wherever there's a platform I want. All I have to do is make sure that they are in the correct order of priority. I don't want these boxes to be on the bottom and these to be on the top. Because then, well, let's actually just see what happens.
that happens because these pair of boxes take priority over these pair of boxes. It doesn't even check the location of these boxes. Rather, it sees these boxes are below me and it drops me down. So I have to make sure that I place the boxes in the correct order of priority when building these platforming sections. Now, the next thing I'm going to be doing is going into game settings and I'm going to zoom in the camera because the next thing I want to talk about is the monkey model that we've got here. So, the reason why I'm using RPG Maker 2 rather than building a game from scratch and therefore being able to have a platforming engine that is not janky is because I would have to create everything from scratch. And that includes a monkey model. And I don't know how to make a 3D model. I don't know how to do rigging. So I'm using what RPG Maker 2 provides. However, there's a catch. RPG Maker 2 does not actually contain a monkey model. Rather, I had to get kind of creative with this. This is not a monkey. This is a baby that has been recolored. RPG Maker 2's character models can be recolored very easily. They don't have any real textures to them outside of the eyes. And even the eyes can be recolored pretty easily. There is an option, as you can see here, to have blank eyes. I could also have those eyes red or not. The only thing I wouldn't be able to change the color of is the pupils. And by the way, this character here is not originally a shadow character. Rather, that's an evil overlord character model colored as a shadow. Now, you might be wondering, if this is actually a recolored baby, why does it have a tail? That is not actually a tail. Even this is complicated. I'm holding L1 in order to zoom in. Although, if you let the game sit for a bit, it does actually tell you what the buttons are. So, a little bit of credit there. But the so-called tail is a visual effect. It is a special effect that I just place on the baby's spine, attached to the baby's spine. And the tail is actually a boomerang. In fact, here is its default color. Now, if you remember when I was showing off Cassandra and the Shadow on RPG Maker 1, Cassandra was a white monkey. However, here in RPG Maker 2, she can't be a white monkey. I mean, it'd be easy enough to recolor that baby as a white monkey. However, when it comes to characters, yeah, you can recolor them easy. Same with monster models. Anything else? The color and texture is baked in. You can see I have it colored white, but all that does is remove any additional color this has. I had to, in fact, darken it in order to make the boomerang details not stand out as much. Meanwhile, if I were to, like, make it yellow, it would not actually be a yellow boomerang. It would be a boomerang that has a yellow tint added to it. Attaching the... oh boy. Attaching the boomerang where I wanted it, by the way. Way more difficult than it should be. Let's go into this. This is like the first location in the animation... We'll call it a script. And... 
creating visual effects in RPG Maker 2 is kind of awful. I mean, you can create a lot of cool effects, but RPG Maker 2 does not have coordinates for your visual effects. And this was kind of complicated because it's like, I, I can't tell where this is attaching to the baby. I have to fix it up in the editor and then exit the visual effects editor, test play, see how it looks on the baby. Oh, the tail is above the baby. Okay, I need to adjust for that. In order to make it a little bit easier, I used an orb as a placement. Let me go to this. There is an orb that is currently 100% transparent, but the first thing I did was place the orb where I want the tail to attach. So I actually had to figure out where to place the orb. Move the orb to a spot. Did it connect where I want? No? Okay, back into the visual effects editor and try again. Eventually I got it and then I was able to attach the boomerang from there. And even then, trying to turn the boomerang is complicated. Let me show you how I would have to do it. So let's go ahead and get a side angle just to see where it is. So I needed to turn the tail a little to the left. So let's go back to a top view and nope, that's turning it one way. I'm pressing left and right in order to turn it that way. Uh, up and down? No, that's actually doing the exact same thing. Uh, shoulder buttons. Okay, that's turning it. Okay, let me back out here in order to get the angle of it back where it was. So, holding X and pressing the shoulder button to turn it. Um, well, there's the base of the tail right there. Or is it up here? I can't tell, actually. Let's go back to the side. Okay, no. The top of the tail is right here. So, I need to... Uh... Well, it's going to be off in this direction, first off. So I need the tail to be right here. Pretend that I still have the orb visible. So I need to kind of... Jimmy it, actually. Because if I'm pressing left and right, it's tilting in that direction. If I'm pressing up and down, it's turning the entire thing. And if I'm just using the shoulder buttons... That is turning it, but it's kind of sideways. So I need to kind of press all the directions. I'm like pressing up and right, now pressing down. Let's press the shoulder button again. All right, uh, that looks about where I would want it. And then from there, it would take some adjusting. Now, when it comes to creating special effects, you're probably not going to have to worry about creating exact angles. You're not likely to attach a boomerang to a baby's spine. But still, having an actual coordinate system, like inputting a number to get its placement, inputting rotation, rather than manually move it, would have definitely made this process easier. Was it worth it though? I would say yes, because I have a monkey. I have a monkey character. I have a monkey character who is going to be able to platform. Except I still have the platform objects in the wrong order. But otherwise, yes, platforming. And I'm just going to delete and reload just to get everything back to working. Alright, back in here, everything is back to working as intended, and I will say this, 
I'm definitely excited at the idea of creating a 3D platformer RPG, but it has come with a bit of a dilemma, that being the narrative. So when I was working on the game for RPG Maker 1, I always intended for the game to have some platforming elements, but RPG Maker 1 is limited with the scripting, no way to actually make a platformer so it would have been more along the lines of you reach a ledge and press a button and it would automatically jump you across otherwise you can't just jump anywhere like you can with this and with that in mind i had a narrative in mind so cassandra starts the game being turned into a monkey She's not going to immediately know her capabilities as being a monkey. Going to take her a bit to discover that she actually has the ability to jump some gaps. But even then, she's not going to indulge in being able to jump across gaps. She doesn't like the idea of being a monkey. Rather, she'll only take advantage of her monkey ability to jump as necessary. And it wouldn't be until two or three hours into the game where the player would finally have the opportunity to do a whole bunch of platforming. It would be at that point where platforming would really start to come into play. But uh, that idea only really worked when platforming was context sensitive. Here, having the player allowed to jump anywhere but I restrict the player from being able to do that for the first two or three hours? Feels really restrictive. I said it's been a while since my first video showing Cassandra and the Shadow on RPG Maker 1, and I gave a couple of reasons why it's been a while since I gave an update. The other reason why it's been a while since I waited to give an update is because this creates a bit of a dilemma. Do I force the player to wait before they can actually start platforming in this platformer RPG? Or do I change the narrative a bit? Make it so that Cassandra is going to have to start platforming right from the start? I'd have been kind of stuck trying to figure that out. Trying to figure out whether... Having a 3D platformer would require changing the narrative too much, and maybe I should just stick with making the game on RPG Maker 2. I didn't want to show off this until I was certain that I would actually be making this. And after giving it a lot of thought, I think I finally know how to change the narrative to allow for the platforming from the start. So here I am. Showing off this neat platforming engine I scripted. And by the way, for anybody curious... Let's see here. We got the jump engine. This is the script that runs whenever you're in an airship. Uh, creating scripts in RPG Maker 2, a lot like creating scripts in any RPG Maker, you have a menu selection. But back to the script. Whenever the character enters the vehicle, they start riding the vehicle, then there's a command to set the player's height, as well as call the jump button script and the fall check script. There are two scripts that control jumping. If we go to the jump button script, here this script is constantly repeating. Starts off by first making sure that the player is not in a state of falling. It only works if they're not falling. Otherwise, the game is waiting for any button inputs. And if the button input is the square button, then it proceeds to do various things in order to force the player's momentum upward. And while the player's momentum is upward, the player can't be falling. But back to the jump engine, along with running a script for the jump button, it is also running a script for the fall check. 
And the file check script is the script that checks what platform you are within the coordinates of. So we're checking platform three, gathering information about the player's coordinates as well as the coordinates of the objects that we're checking the placement of in order to find their coordinates to figure out whether we're over a platform. Complicated stuff, to be sure. And if, for example, we happen to be within the coordinates of Platform 2 and able to fall onto it, it then calls a falling script. And this is the script that basically has gravity. Increasing gravity the longer you fall. And the moment you stop falling, that's the point where Gravi the acceleration is reset. And somewhere in here, it's also checking whether the player has started falling below the platform and immediately puts them back on the platform. Regardless of the rate of acceleration, there is no chance of the player actually falling through the platform. Because the game is not checking for new platform coordinates, rather it is already still keeping the current platform coordinates in mind. If we're below that platform's coordinates, we're moved back up in onto the floor. Really, really complicated to set this up. And in fact, I had to create some, some notes here in order to remind myself, what exactly is this stuff doing? And I don't mind actually showing these scripts on camera. I doubt anybody is going to plagiarize these scripts. I mean, this is an old PlayStation 2 RPG maker. The only people who are going to really be able to take advantage of it are anybody who emulates this old RPG maker 2 PlayStation 2 RPG maker. Now you'll also notice there is a jump forward script right here. This was my first idea whenever I was still having the platforming be context sensitive. That was before I decided, wait, I could totally make a 3D platformer engine. So yeah, definitely some fun behind-the-scenes stuff there. And by the way, one thing the central engine does as well, while the player has control of the airship, those other scripts continue to run. If I allowed the player to get off the airship, that would end all the scripts related to the airship. So basically, what I have to do is, if the player tries to get off the airship, I just have a repeating loop forcing the player back onto the airship. So they are always on the airship. Very complicated. You gotta kinda know what you're doing with RPG Maker 2. And though, although I never actually made a game with RPG Maker 2, I've tinkered with it enough that I had a general idea of what I was doing. And I also have some programming experience, so that definitely helps. As well as watching a certain Mario 64 video about invisible walls. Anyway, I still have uh, quite a bit of work to do with this. Th so far, I've basically only worked on the platforming and also figuring out how to make Cassandra work as an AI character in battle. RPG Maker 2 does allow that, but um, the default options that RPG Maker 2 comes with are limited, so I kind of had to reverse engineer the AI scripts for battle in order to figure out how to make Cassandra work the way I want. RPG Maker 2's battle system works just a little bit differently than RPG Maker 1's, and I already had ideas with RPG Maker 1's battle system, so gotta try to make it work in RPG Maker 2. Other than that, 
I have not even created the opening cutscene yet. I have not created that forest again. I have not created the first town again. Not that I did much with that yet. There's no cutscenes. It's just a jump engine and slightly modified battle system. So, might be a while before you see an update. And on that note, I don't know that I will post every update here at YouTube. More likely, I will post little updates from time to time over at Mastodon and Blue Sky, which I am going to link in the description. Mastodon and Blue Sky are Twitter alternatives, for those of you wondering. I also have to try to figure out how much I can post, because I don't want to post, like, everything I'm doing in the game, because, well, I mean, I gotta keep some surprises. But it's going to be really hard not posting anything once I get to later areas in the game. Don't want to show those. I think it'll be worth the effort for the sake of placing and creating a 3D platformer RPG. Even if not many people are going to be able to play this. I just want to say that I created a 3D platformer RPG for RPG Maker 2. Heck, it'd be nice to say I created any game for RPG Maker 2. Anyway, I gotta get going. Hope you enjoyed this little developer log here. My Let's Plays continue tomorrow.